We start the um, plenary session about uh, mathematics and general relativity. So I call uh, uh, Katharina Reisner to speak from the University of York. There are seats uh, on the next floor you can reach if uh, everything is uh, full here. There are seats uh, on the higher level. Okay, thank you very much um, for coming to my lecture, and it's a great honor for me to uh, give a talk at this fantastic conference. So I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance. So today I want to tell you about some interesting things, uh, both in mathematics and in physics, which happen at the intersection of um, quantum world and uh, general relativity. So. Uh, my talk will be about quantum field theory, quantum field theory on curved space-time, and also how much one can use that to learn something also about effective quantum gravity. So uh, let me start. Uh, the approach which I'm using, which I want to tell you about, is called algebraic quantum field theory. And it goes back quite a long time. So uh, it started as the axiomatic framework by uh, Hack and Kassler from uh, the paper from 1987. And the idea was to uh, develop a mathematical framework to study quantum field theory. So at the beginning, it was just a quantum field theory on flat Minkowski spacetime. And the idea was to um, describe the model in terms of local observables. So the locality was always a very important feature. And um, the idea is that you look at uh, some bounded regions of space-time, and then uh, you try to uh, model the algebra of observables that can be measured in uh, such regions. So it's a very operational idea. You base your theory on what you can actually measure. OK, so in this uh, transparency, there is uh, some region O1 and there is an algebra of observables that I can measure in O1. Now, using some physical considerations, I can um, impose some conditions that such a model should satisfy. And the first fundamental property is that this model should be consistent with the notion of subsystems. So if I have a smaller region, like for example this room, and I embed it into a larger region, like for example the city of Rome, I don't want uh, suddenly my observables, which I can measure here, to disappear. So uh, the idea is that uh, the algebra of observables that I can measure in the city of Rome is, contains also the observables I can measure in that room. And this is... Uh, realized by the condition of isotony. So if I have um, a region O1 contained in O2, then there should be also corresponding morphism of algebras. And this is here realized at this picture. So I have inclusion of space-time regions, and I have corresponding inclusion of the algebra. So this kind of diagrams will also appear later on. OK, so maybe just a brief uh, commercial now. There's a commercial break. Uh, the algebraic approach has been used also way outside quantum field theory. So it connects to various um, aspects of uh, physics, of mathematics. So there are many branches uh, which kind of branch out of algebraic approach. So. Uh, 
the things which I want to focus on during this talk is the locally covariant quantum field theory, that's this bubble, and perturbative algebraic quantum field theory. So here there are applications in cosmology, in particle physics, uh, randomization theory, and also uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, some things we can learn about effective quantum gravity. So, uh, okay. Now, this was all on flat space time. Now, I want to tell you something about what happens if we have some curvature. So, there are certain difficulties in quantum field theory and curved space time as such. Uh, and I want to mention uh, some of them. So, the first thing on a generic space time, the group of symmetries is uh, going to be quite small or even trivial. So the idea that particles are something like irreducible representations of a Poincaré group and so on, this idea will not work generically because, uh, well, there is no uh, Poincaré group action. There is usually not uh, any other natural symmetry group to replace it. So it has to do something else. Now, also the same problem uh, causes the fact that uh, the idea that the vacuum is something like translation invariant state also doesn't make sense in this context. So there won't be no distinguished vacuum state. There will be no um, unique state with no particles. And also uh, another problem is uh, if we want to do big rotation, so if we want to do uh, computations using imaginary time, uh, which is often done in quantum field theory and flat space time. This works only in special cases. So this is another possible obstruction. And finally, there are also some problems with Fourier transform. So uh, all the ideas where you make computations in momentum space, uh, this is also going to fail in general. So there's a whole load of problems which we encounter if we want to think of quantum field theory on curved space times. Now, Many of these, and if not all of these problems, can be solved if we slightly change our perspective. So what I want to advertise here somehow to look at quantum field theory from a slightly different angle, and you realize that at least some of the problems go away. So uh, in the algebraic approach, which I just mentioned, uh, some of these difficulties do not appear. And well, uh, this idea to use the algebraic approach in to fit your and curve space time, this is quite new, and uh, the framework itself goes under the name of locally covariant quantum field theory, and names which I should mention is uh, Holland and Wald, uh, who laid the foundation of that framework in their CMP paper from 2001. Also, at the same time, was another foundational paper by Brunetti, Fren, Hagen, and Fech, and sometime later, there was also important contribution of Fuster and Fech, uh, which also solved some of the fundamental problems of uh, interpretation of quantum field theory and curve space time. Okay, so if you want to know more about these aspects, please come to QFT parallel sessions. There will be very interesting talks there and uh, on related subjects. Now, here I just want to uh, quickly uh, mention what are main advantages of this approach and why does it solve some of our problems. So first of all, uh, we do not need to fix a Hilbert space from the beginning. So we are not so worried about the fact that there is no unique vacuum. So what we construct is very abstract general mathematically general objects, which are algebras of observables. So we focus on the algebraic side of things. So we want to construct the observables uh, as something universal. And then if we want to go back to a Hilbert space representation, then we do it at the later stage. So um, it's OK if there are many inequivalent representations. It's OK if there are many states, uh, as long as we can construct our uh, algebra of observables. And this algebra of observables that can be measured in bounded regions of space-time, now it's an arbitrary space-time, this is constructed from the local data. So 
uh, we are concerned about operations which we can uh, perform locally, and this is what our model describes. And this allows to uh, make distinction to separate two features of the model. So uh, first, uh, the local features which are related to the algebras, so the local features are the observables, and the global features which are then encoded in the state. So step one, we construct local observables. Step two, we look at the concrete state which uh, contains some global information about the theory. Okay, so now I want to give you some more details about uh, the locally covariant quantum field theory approach, but still I don't want to go too deeply into technicalities, so I just want to give you some impression of what uh, this is all about. So first, a generalization which we make is, okay, well, we looked at uh, bounded regions of a fixed space-time, we looked at how they embed into each other, uh, just describe the subsystems, but we can go a step farther. So we can look at uh, arbitrary space-time, so we can uh, replace the picture I had before with uh, two regions of a fixed space-time, now with a picture that I have one space-time M and another space-time N. So here in my notation, uh, M and N are um, the manifold, G and G prime are the metrics. So these are two space times which I then embed into each other. And now I want this embedding to be an isometry. And well, there are also other things which I could require. So it's natural to require that such an embedding preserves orientation. So we don't want to uh, think of a subsystem which has a different time orientation or a different orientation of uh, the larger thing. And we also don't want uh, the causal structure to be distorted by such an embedding. So after the embedding, we do not want uh, new causal links to appear in the image of embedded spacetimes uh, due to the embedding. So that's uh, the causality preserving condition. And now we assign algebras. So uh, to each space-time, we assign an algebra. So this is the algebra of the space-time M. This is the algebra of observables on the space-time N. But this is not everything, because we also have to specify how they fit into each other. So we think of one as the subsystem of the other, but we still have to say what's the map from the one to the other. So how do we identify um, the elements of the larger algebra with the elements of the smaller one. So to each embedding psi, we need to uh, assign also uh, the embedding of uh, the algebra. So A of psi is the map between algebras. And this all has to be done covariantly. So uh, this whole structures have to fit together nicely. This is uh, described by the mathematical formalism of locally covariant quantum field theory. And a very important notion in this framework is a notion of fields. So um, first, intuitively speaking, what's a field in our approach? So if we have space-time without symmetries, there's absolutely no way we could uh, transport observables from one region to the other. So it seems that there's no way to compare what does it mean to measure the same thing like the curvature, temperature, um, momentum of a particle, whatever, what does it mean to measure the same thing in a different place? Because there are no symmetries in general. Now, this is exactly what a quantum field tells us. So a quantum field is something which uh, labels the observables, which puts tags on them, so that we know that, oh, this is momentum, this is temperature, and this is curvature at the point. So uh, a quantum field here uh, would be a, a family of maps which uh, somehow generalizes the notion of Whiteman fields. So if we have a test function uh, F, which is supported, compactly supported, sitting in some region O, then 
we can, using this family of maps, we can associate to the field, to this field phi O of F, which corresponds, for example, to the measurement of the temperature. And then if we uh, look at the larger space-time and we look at the image of this region O, we can also assign a corresponding field to uh, the push forward of the test function, and we also know that this is going to be the temperature measurement in the larger space time. And this happens for all the regions, so for all the regions we can identify what would be the measurement of the temperature. And what's very fundamental here is the covariance condition, which uh, essentially tells me that, okay, well, I have this structure of embeddings of space times, I have these maps from observable algebras uh, of one space-time to the observable algebra of the other. So all these things have to be compatible. So if you look at this uh, equation for a minute, here on the left-hand side, I have the observable which is assigned to the test function f. It leaves here on the bottom. Then I have a psi, which is a map from the algebra assigned to this region to the algebra assigned to the large region. So the left-hand side tells me uh, what would be the element of the larger algebra, which I obtain by, uh, as, well, by acting with uh, this algebra morphism. Well, on the right-hand side, if I want to obtain the element of the algebra above, then I just push forward the test function, I get something which is supported here, and I get the corresponding field which lives on the larger algebra. So this is somehow compatibility of the two ways I can get a, a field in a larger, uh, corresponding to the larger space from something which corresponds to the smaller space. And this is the so-called covariance condition. Now, uh, our postulate, our idea, is that we can use this locally covariant quantum fields as um, the candidate for observables in GR. So I will show you briefly how to uh, use these concepts, at least in effective quantum gravity, to understand better um, how to use uh, concepts of quantum field theory also uh, in quantizing gravity. Okay, so let me now uh, briefly uh, recall you what are the difficulties of quantum gravity. I sure that most of you know, and some of you are struggling with solving these problems uh, as well. So first uh, problem is that uh, in quantum gravity, uh, in contrast to QFT on curved spacetime, uh, the curvature is going to be something dynamical. And this is related to the condition of background independence. So we want our theory, even if we make a split into perturbation and the background metric, we want the theory to be background independent. Another one is that, okay, due to the diffeomorphism invariance of the theory, which is a feature of Einstein's equations, points lose their meaning. So we have to have concepts which are independent of the notion of points. We don't want to put a priori labels on the points. And finally, well, there's a bit of a technical issue. Uh, as a quantum field theory, uh, quantum gravity is non-renormalizable. Okay, so now in the remaining time I want to tell you uh, what's our idea to solve some of these problems, and this is based on um, a recent paper of uh, Romeo Brunetti, Klaus Frenhagen, and myself, which you can find on the archive. Uh, so the first, well, fairly obvious thing to do is somehow to go around this non-renormalizability problem by saying, well, okay, the theory is non-summable, but we can still calculate finite contributions at each order uh, in H bar at a fixed energy scale. So this is a bit of a cheating, but still allows to compute something finite which you could potentially compare with experiment. And well, the framework which we are using, which works great 
uh, in position space, which is very well designed to work on curved space time, is the so-called Epstein-Glaser randomization. So if you ever heard about it, then you probably uh, realize why does it work. If not, then please come to uh, other sessions at this conference. There should be definitely something more about it. Um, <coughs> but uh, I won't talk about it more. I would like to focus on the two other aspects. So first is the background independence. And uh, this we achieve by uh, first, although we make the split into the background and perturbation, we show that the theory is at least perturbatively background independent. So I hope I will have time to remark on this at the end. And the second uh, problem which we now understand how to solve is the deformorphism invariance. So we deal with it by using uh, the so-called battalion wilkowinski formalism, which is uh, a technique, which is a method in quantum field theory to deal with theories with some kind of gauge invariance or uh, more general with local symmetry invariance. And then the problem of observables is solved by uh, using this quantum fields I mentioned before and uh, by using the notion of relational observables. Okay, so let me uh, proceed. Now, I want to give you uh, a short overview of uh, how to construct things um, in this approach. So first, uh, we start with some region of space-time and uh, we have some observable which we want to measure. And then, uh, well, since we do not measure things at the point, since there is always some smearing related to experimental uncertainty or whatever, uh, it's a good idea to think of uh, our observables as some quantity smeared with a test function. So this is similar to what I said before. And in the next step, we make the split of the metric into background and perturbation. So we can characterize our theory in terms of the objects of the type I presented before. So this would be the locally covariant quantum fields. And now the deformorphism invariance is uh, the transformation which moves the experimental setup to different... How much time? Okay. Okay, so maybe I will skip the more technical part. Uh, now, just wanted to tell you something about the deformorphism invariance in this context. So here uh, we have deformorphism transformations, infinitesimal deformorphism transformations, which correspond to, uh, well, essentially uh, acting by the lead derivative uh, along some vector field. So uh, vector fields on a manifold can be thought of as infinitesimal deformorphisms. And if we act with such an infinitesimal deformorphism on a locally covariant field, then it has, this action has two components. One is related to the fact that we transform the metric and the other is related to the fact that we transform the test function. So somehow that we move points around. And the quantity is said to be deformorphism invariance if uh, this action vanishes. So if the sum of these two terms is zero. And as an example, uh, here there is a quantity which is deformorphism invariant in our sense and the other is not because the measure with which we integrate depends only on the background metric, not on the full metric. And this is uh, a big difference. Uh, somehow we break uh, the covariance of the theory, so we break the deformorphism invariance. Okay, so the quantities of this type are going to be quantized. So we develop a theory which works with this kind of observables. And now, well, this can be related to the notion of relational observables if we fix some coordinate system. So uh, we want to make uh, this test function to be dependent on the choice of coordinate system. And we achieve that by uh, saying that the coordinate system is fixed by uh, introducing 
for scalar fields which parameterize points of space-time. And then uh, we say that uh, the change of the test function is due to the coordinate change uh, of the scalar fields. And then ca they can be either interpreted as uh, some matter fields, as some dust fields, or uh, there are some quantities constructed from the curvature. Okay, so I will skip the last slide and just come to the conclusion. So, uh, in our framework, uh, we achieved uh, to construct uh, a consistent model where the diffeomorphism invariance is uh, formulated in terms of locally covariant fields, which can also be then related to relational observables, so objects were uh, not uh, the absolute value of something is important, but rather the relation between various quantities. And we also uh, showed the uh, background independence of the theory, which unfortunately I don't have more time to talk about, but uh, I invite you to look into our paper and see that it actually works out. And yeah, I think it's very exciting to find out that there is a lot about quantum gravity which can be learned also from the QFT side. Um, there are many open questions, so uh, now we are starting to construct models where uh, one can apply these ideas in cosmology or in black hole physics, and there's a lot of go things going on, and I hope that some of it is going to be covered also in the parallel sessions. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.